Hello, we are live with another Platform YA book club. I am so excited today to be talking about the upper world, the uh, which I have right in front of me with like uh, all my wires are crossed. Ta da! I actually have um, the advanced reader's copy, um, very shiny, very black, but I imagine everyone else has probably got a much more colorful front cover than I do. Um, but I'm so, so excited to be joined by Femi Faraba, who is going to be chatting to us all about the book, the process, life, the universe. And I can actually say that because we kind of are like this, like that, that isn't even an exaggeration. Like this book talks about physics and free will and like a ton of stuff that is very complicated and that we will dig into. Um, but before we do, um, for those who are watching, maybe you've come across this, maybe you've heard about the book and you were having a little Google and you're like, what is this video I'm watching? Um, this is the platform YA book club every um, month we read another book by a YA author and then we get to talk to the author um, and you get to ask them your questions so in the description will be all the info on how to join our discord um, and find out about what books are coming next etc etc um, during this chat we I take some questions from the chat so if you're watching on YouTube you can type your questions and I will ask them directly to the author um, and you can ask in advance on Discord all that jazz and um, for the first part of this video we are going to be just uh, talking about the the book in general and, and Femi's process and all that kind of stuff and then we will move on to spoiler territory in the second half of the video so for everyone who hasn't quite finished the book yet, if there is anyone out there who managed to put it down, um, we will make it very obvious that we're about to go into spoiler territory and then we'll get to talk uh, to everyone who has read the book, dig into the details, which is very exciting. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask you the first question, which is, um, what should we go with? Oh, I feel like a really an obvious question for this first one. Uh, what was your inspiration for including so much science and maths and physics and things in the book? <laughs> yeah, no. Nah, um, so firstly, thank you everyone for joining. It's, it's really cool to be here. Um, it's not, it's, yeah, given that the book only came out recently, it's, uh, I haven't had many occasions to chat to people who've actually read the book yet. So it's, this is, I'm excited for this. Um, yeah, no, nah, so in terms of the, the physics and the science sort of inspiration, I mean, going really far back I, I used to be pretty crap in school all round um and also very crap in, in maths and physics um and sciences in general and i was lucky enough you know my early teens to have a teacher actually it wasn't even a teacher it's not a guy in my school who was a, a janitor um i don't usually say that too much because it sounds like i just copied a storyline from goodwill hunting <laughs> <laughs> like i got taught by matt damon <laughs> um but yeah no he's uh yeah he he he, he gave me a bunch of like these random books that he had lying around and, and sort of also followed up and, and got me a bit more interested. He didn't do that much teaching, but he got that spark, the curiosity spark going. Um, and it changed the way I looked at myself, not just the way I looked at the subject, the way I looked at myself. I think before I always thought that, you know, you're just good at things like you're good at physics or you're not, or you're good at writing or you're not. Um, so I went from being not good at physics to, to being really good at it and sort of then just going all, all the way, like just pursuing it. And I did it sort of, you know, uni, I ended up specializing in quantum physics and just doubled down on it basically. Um, but then I left like the academic world and went into the real world and went and worked in a sort of corporate job and all kinds of stuff, solar energy. Um, but the whole time that I was out of physics, I still thought about it a lot. Um, I'd read these sort of pop science books um, and I'll chat to people and I tell them about, they'd ask me stuff about physics and I'll say, okay, let me give you like a two minute explanation of quantum physics or relativity or whatever. And then they'd always ask, you know, this is really interesting. Where can I find out more? And I always struggled to find a recommendation that I, A, they, you know, would be pitched to the right level, B, that they would have a reason to give a crap about, you know, in the first place, like what, what's being taught. Um, and so, yeah, is that sort of standard Tony Morrison quote, if there's a book out there that hasn't been written um, that you want to read, you must write it. Mm -hmm. And so I went about writing it. Um, but in addition to the physics stuff, I wanted to make sure that it felt grounded because the physics stuff can, you know, it's not, it's not going to be everyone's perfect cup of tea. Um, and also it's a little bit abstract and out there. And so that's also uh, kind of determined my decision to, to really ground the story um, in a proper place. And that's, that's kind of why I chose like Peckham 
as a proper proper place that you could actually go and visit and touch and feel um and then sort of on the other hand you have this sort of more dreamy stuff to contrast it so you get best of both worlds of it i was gonna ask like how do you try and make sure that when you're writing about these like complicated theories and ideas that like your teen readers are gonna understand what the hell you're talking about yeah so the first thing I would say is I'm not actually aiming for 100% understanding. And so if anybody who's read this book feels like I mostly understood, it, I think, but not 100%, don't worry, you're, you're in good company. There are no physicists alive who fully understand time, <laughs> time or time travel. And they all, you know, if you put them all in a room, they would all disagree on how it works. Um, I was almost sort of aiming to get people to 78% understanding and them still having questions. Um, so that if they want to, they can go out and kind of just, yeah, take that next step on their own. Um, so it's really just giving you a foundation of some of the weird things that we've discovered about um, space and time in the universe and our relationship with it in terms of how we experience life um, going along this line of time. I feel very reassured by that because I was like, yeah, I understand <laughs> what's happening. Sure. Yeah, it's sure. <laughs> um, I wanted to kind of ask, like, as someone who obviously knows a lot about this stuff and is like uh, literally like studied it and has now written a book about it. Um, are you like big on sci-fi in general? Do you or do you kind of get frustrated that it isn't sciencey enough? Like it's like they're saying stuff and you're like, that doesn't even make sense. That's not how physics works. Or do you just like escape into it and don't care at that point? Nah, I mean, do you know what? So I don't I don't care. I don't care. If it's a good film, it's a good film. If it has sick science, well backed up science, then that that's definitely a bit of a plus, but it's still always about the story. I think if if I had succeeded only on the physics stuff and it was a really rubbish story, I think that would have been a failure for me as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is one area though which annoys me with films is when, when the physics is A, not needed or B, wrong and they still go through extra lengths to like really explain, explain the wrong it. physics. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. that was like, all right, come on, man, let's move on. <laughs> Um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the writing process and um, we talk about this a lot with uh, our authors on here and it's always so interesting because everyone has such different answers even to like the same questions about writing process um so how much do you plan before you start writing are you someone who like plans every plot point or are you just like I don't know we'll see where this ends let's go you know it's interesting that you're asking this question right now because I'm writing my book too and so mm. with book two I've taken the completely opposite approach to book one so Oh, nice. With, with book one, I just wrote, I just got got a pen and the paper and I just, wrote, well, not a pen and paper, my, my laptop and I just wrote. Um, I had like a really basic structure. I knew who my main character was going to be. I knew roughly what they were going to be like and I knew what the starting point was going to be. Mm -hmm. And also like maybe the first sort of conflict. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of freestyled from there. And I, it was Stephen King's book on writing that sort of said, you know, when you're, when you're early on, just write as fast as your, 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 your fingers will allow you because the, the enemy at that stage isn't actually a crap book. It's not ever finishing. Yeah. And so for the first draft, the only two words that matter are, are, are the end. <laughs> and then you can, once you have something to edit, you can take it to the next level quite easily and then the next level after that. But editing a blank page doesn't make sense. It's, yeah, it's, it's not an option. Um, but with book two, I'm a bit bit more confident as a, as a writer. Um, and so in order to basically save time this time a little bit, so I don't have too many rewrites, um, I've been planning. But then I, I've definitely gotten stuck, eh? Because with the planning stuff, that then engages my sort of scientific mind. Mm. Um, and I, I, I'm realizing that story structure has so many interlinking aspects. Yeah, and if yeah. you want to really emphasize a story, there's different things you have to do. So like, for instance, what your character faces in a story, I've heard this at different places, like it, it needs to be ironic. Um, and so an ironic thing would be a, a film like The Matrix, right? You got this, um, this completely typical um, office worker, he works in a corporate office, IT. He's a, a, a sort of short haired, white male, you know, nice guy. And of all people to get told that um 
there's actually a completely different reality and he's uh, he's actually a slave <laughs> um and that there's this completely exotic thing out there that um sorry by the way my wife just called me i got uh hang this up <laughs> See, i didn't realize my uh my computer had whatsapp like that i'm just gonna tell her to like so, sorry i'm uh, actually in the middle of uh doing an interview uh so <laughs> I'm just here being very fancy. Don't yeah, mind. no, okay. She, 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 she got it. She got it. Sorry about that, guys. That's all right. um, but yeah, no. And, and you know, in, in in the upper world, you have a boy who is incredible. Like with Esso, for instance, right? You have a, a boy who's incredibly short sighted, um, who ends up getting this gift where he can see glimpses of the future. Mm. Um, anyway, I'm going off track a bit, but the point is, please, please of... go off track. That was really interesting because I hadn't really <laughs> thought about it that. But the, you're like, you are right. Like that irony of like of all the people to be to given this. Like this is the boy who got it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so you have an immediate link there from the sort of plot point that the catalyst thing that changes that that sort of hits the, confronts the character to the traits of the character, right? Mm. And then from the traits of the character, you have a direct link from what traits they have to what wound in their past caused those traits if that makes any sense like our, our our makeup our personality is usually the the product of things in our past um usually um yeah wounds essentially and so then you think about that and then yeah i, I just found that a lot of the the stuff kind of flows from one to the next so i've enjoyed plotting this time around. i think it's probably something i do next time but just the thing of plotting you just got to get to 80 percent and then just move on otherwise you'd be there forever <laughs> that makes a lot of sense um we're going to take our first question from uh readers for anyone who is currently uh watching and missed the the very start if you have any questions for femi please put them in the the chat on youtube and i will ask them uh so pippin who is in fact i can see in the chat already um but did this question in advance um why did you decide to name the chapters now and 15 years later rather than have it as 15 years before like how did you decide on that stuff was that like deliberate or were you kind of uh wanting to like center it on, on so and then bring in ria later that's a do you know what i mean it's a fair question time is relative and so neither is right to be honest <laughs> um i could have done it the other way i actually never thought about that actually it's interesting i think what actually happened was when i was writing it the year was I think Esso's storyline is, is 2021. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, okay, this is now. Um, but yeah, if if I had some foresight, I might have done <laughs> 2035 as, as now. Um, that way it would have felt contemporary in, in 14 years from now. But um, Yeah, I know that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I also chose not to sort of even put the dates as the chap mm -hmm. chapter titles so that it would also wouldn't feel too dated, so that it would sort of carry on with time a bit as well. It makes a lot of sense. Um so how okay speaking of this this future world that's not because it's not a future world which is like you know hundreds of years in the future or like thousands of years in the future it's it's fairly like soon um how did you come up with this how, kind of what that future world is going to look like because you've got these really familiar things of like football uh, that seem kind of like timeless in a lot of ways, but then you also have like an AI telling a therapist like what to say to their client. Like, yeah. where do those ideas come from? Like, to make it sort of different from now, but not completely alien. It's interesting. I mean, like, it's funny when, when, when you look at something like Back to the Future. They they predicted that in the year I think it's twenty eighteen that we'd all be riding like sort of like floating skateboards. Yeah, hoverboards. <laughs> class. I know yeah. I had a hoverboard then, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But that, that didn't shape out um, quite yet. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that it, it's it's a funny one. So the, the, there's three options you have when you're predicting the future, right? One, and you start, you basically start off from looking at the current point and the trend of that point, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be anything. It could be people are um, just trying to make up something. People are, let's just say people decided to start drinking more and more alcohol. Let's say the alcohol consumption in Britain increased from, you know, X percent to Y percent. Um, there's three things that can happen to that. One is it can you can accentuate it, which is quite an interesting thing to do and just have like an epidemic <laughs> um, of that kind of thing. Another option is to reverse it and say, actually, no, people can really switch from that to, to something healthier. Um, there's a massive health uptick in, in, in Britain, whatever. 
Um, and then the third option is to cycle it. So to say that by the point where we're, we're there again, it's come back to the same point it was right now. So I was in Hamburg maybe a month, a couple of weeks ago, and it was 60 students, all sort of 15, 16 year olds. And they asked a similar question about predicting the future. And I was just sort of like, there was a girl in the front row and I said, those are Air Force Ones, right? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, those are the same shoes I was wearing when I was your age. <laughs> and so there's so many things that sort of cycle around. And that's why I have like, you know, a lot of the kids still wearing Air Maxes. Um, but then in other places, for instance, like therapy is run by artificial intelligence bots, essentially. And um, you have this sort of mega corporation uh, canters that, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I kind of made deliberate decisions, but try to keep quite a lot of things constant because yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think that made, that was like so well done for me, at least I was thinking, because it's, you know, you don't want it to be this like, and in 15 years time, I think so different. But when you think about what was going on in 15 years ago, just like people's lives had these, had were so different just because of things that seem really small right now of like, oh yeah, so I just like check Twitter and you're like, but what was Twitter? That long ago it was didn't yeah. exist but it's it's such a big part of life like these social media things so yeah it was so it 100%. was like so well done and um, we've had another we've had a 100%. question and just just on that last topic oh no I'm go for it i think that's another i mean this is i think why science fiction is the most interesting because you get to take human beings and put them in completely sort of outlandish otherworldly scenarios um and they still act exactly the same way <laughs> And so that is one thing that's kind of whenever you're future casting, that's always quite comforting. Like it's, it's human behavior is probably not going to change. Like Plato was writing about things that are way more intelligent than anything I can produce. Um, and so like, you know what I mean? The, 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 we've been thinking about these questions of like these same questions of who am I? Where am I going? Where do I belong? You know, what does this all mean? And how do I spend my time? Um, yeah, since we've been thinking. Amazing. Um, so we've had a question in the chat from Melody um, about when you were kind of talking around your, your planning and your plotting and all that kind of stuff and like what inspired you to write originally. Um, and they've asked, what did, uh, when did you know you had the story? Was there a single moment or did it happen as a process when you were beginning to sort of to, to feel it out? Um, well, I should note that I never thought that I had a story that was going to do quite what, what it's done. <laughs> Um, it built, it took me a long time to build that kind of, first of all, confidence that I could be a writer. Again, I mentioned earlier on about how, you know, when I was younger, I had this fixed view that I wasn't good at science. And then I got, got finally had somebody who showed me, oh, by the way, there's these simple steps. And it was the same with writing. I, I, I became a scientist and then I, I lived for the next how many years, decade with this view that I'm a scientist and I'm not a writer, like I'm not one of the English people. Like I, I stopped doing English, English at GCSE basically. So I just pegged myself as somebody who couldn't do English or couldn't do writing. And so the first step was breaking that fixed mindset because writing is just like anything else. There was like three or four books I read, which kind of gave me a lot of the cheat codes. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's cheat codes for sure. Um, and also just, yeah. So anyway, that, 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 was, that was kind of the first thing. Um, was the question how long did it take to yeah like when did you know you had the story like do you yeah yeah and and so um yeah it was really organic i have to say so what I, what i had was half the story already built in i kind of had a leg up because part of my goal was to explain this time travel physics stuff and so you know that was already that's already been discovered and written down god god did that part basically <laughs> Um, and then the, the, the nature did that part. Um, and then the second thing was kind of building the story around Esso and Rhea. Um, and that took on quite a few different shapes. I would say I felt comfortable after maybe two, a month or two, maybe a month of just stewing over it. Um, this is three years ago, mind you. But um, yeah, you just start with some bare bones. And then as soon as you feel 80% comfortable, you just got to start writing basically um because you'll never get to 100 percent. amazing um i'm gonna take another question from the chat because why not um so matt um who already was absolutely ragging on you for that phone call 
thoroughly modern interview <laughs> laughing emoji love it um did actually then ask a very nice question um what kind of reaction have you had from teen readers have you heard from young people maybe those specifically who've been involved in gangs or crime and if not do you hope to yeah yeah i mean so it's still quite early on i've had like quite a lot of reaction from young readers but um i think i kind of wish this is happening like a week from now because i've got like a couple of weeks of school visits like including one mm. like next tuesday i think i'm seeing like 500 kids um who've all read the book um at, at two different schools but um so far it's been really strong it's been really encouraging i mean i i mostly wrote it for that demographic i knew it had crossover appeal with adults because you got a lot of people like me who still have a ju juvenile sense of humor um but yeah, I really wanted kids. I wrote it for the sort of 15 or whatever year old me. Um, so the reaction has been really good. I mean, I, there was actually one girl who said she was never really interested in science or that stuff. And um, it's kind of built up her confidence. I met her like two nights ago. Um, she, I think she was like 12, 16 or so. Um, but then on the question of like, do you know, it's, it's interesting. This guy's, I think this guy's asking like, you know, if someone's on the road right now, am I hopeful that they, they will get this in their hands and, and be touched by it sort of. And I think my answer is, yeah, I mean, yeah, I really do hope so. Um, you know, I think there's lots of kids in, in school right now who are being encouraged to read. And so I think even if it's not someone's first instinct to like say, oh, let me pick up this book by Femi Fadiba, um, I think uh, hopefully what will happen is if you're in school and um, you have to read a book, <laughs> you know, in school that this will be an option that's given because I think it will be a story that relates to them and speak to them a lot more directly than a lot of the other options. Um, so I'm really hopeful for that, you know, I, I, it's difficult for me to tell because I'm still new to this publishing industry, exactly the channels to getting it to, 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 to those guys as well. Um, but I think it would do a lot of good. I mean, the book is based off of real stuff. I mean, to be honest, I, I suspect if like, I mean, I, I have some guys who I've shared it with as well, like a couple of guys who, who, who would understand um, and, and sort of made sure it was validated. But um, yeah, yeah, no, hopefully it connects. Yeah, I mean, Matt's just said you completely nailed the voice and I agree like as someone who is from from South London as well. Um, Thank you. I was like, I was reading it and I was like, oh, this is so strange because it's it's the accent you can hear the accent you can hear the intonation of like every kid that you like went to school with or hearing on the bus or like I still hear in the shopping centers and stuff I'm like oh this is so strange because it's not it's not a voice that I feel like I've heard a lot in in fiction I was just like oh this is so I've like taken me back to being at school it was so nice yeah, I love but it, like I, love it, I, love it. I kind of wanted to ask like how do you ensure that you're writing like as an adult still feels like it's like relatable to modern teenagers that you're like still in that voice and like in that kind of world rather than being like it's kind of feeling like you're using the slang or talking like you were when you were at school yeah there's, there's a few aspects here so the first thing is in real life um people don't use this is in general there's there's extremes obviously but in real life people don't use as much slang as they kind of make it out in in film sometimes like sometimes i'll see like someone on film from south london and every line just filled with slang and it's like <laughs> it's like almost like they try to force it in every every sentence so i didn't actually have to use as much slang as as people would think you know i just had to make sure like the sentence structures like roughly the same um but no i i think that's one thing the second thing is um things don't change as much as people think again um like the slang that I was around when I was a kid, a lot of it's a good amount of it's changed, but a lot of it stayed the same. Um, and you know, it's it's quite easy to sort of yeah, it, it, that wasn't too easy. And then and the, I mean, too difficult. And the third thing was um, I, mean, I listened to like um, music by the kids to you know kids today basically. Like most of the time, I was I was writing this book. I had like a no T and digger D in the background, mm. um, and um, I've got like. My fam, when I was during COVID, I was sort of like locked down. Um, yeah, I just got younger family members. Um, so I was, ex I was exposed to, I was in the mix. Um, but having said that, it's probably not perfect, but I think that's mostly okay, just because 
yeah, I think uh, in general, people aren't really getting too much of this at all. So I'm, I'm quite, I'm happy with this sort of level it's at. Love it. Um, we've had a few more questions in the chat, but again, I'm in charge today. So I'm going back to some of the other questions. <laughs> no one's going to stop me. I can do what I like. Um, yeah, no. But, but then also on, the, on this, I mean, the slang thing, I, I mean, if, if people can't hear, I have a few different things going on in my accent as well. Um, just because my background is a few different places. I, I wasn't in Peckham the whole time. I was sort of, I spent some time in the US. Um, I went to a school outside of London as well. Um, and so it's kind of all in there. But I think navigating a bunch of different worlds also is giving me a bit of an eye to to see kind of different, yeah, just to pick out things a little bit. I think it's helped. In some ways it, it's harder because, um, but yeah, in some ways it helps. Mm. I think truly as someone from South London, the people who will find this book the most strange, unusual, exotic even are those from North London who refuse to come <laughs> south of the river um, and must be called out for it. I was like, I you know, don't deserve I this. Know, you don't deserve Peckham. Get out of here. I know. I know <laughs> it's so funny, isn't it? That was like back in the days, that was like the wall, man. That was the, you know, Game of Thrones, the, the Thames was the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Um, so... Uh, We'll talk about character now because I feel like we've not we've not kind of talked about the characters. Um, when you were like Esther and Maria's age, what were you like? Were like, do, do you see yourself in those characters, or were you like totally different? Kind of wanted to write about someone who's different, different to you. Yeah, you know, I think so. I think when I was fifteen, sixteen, I was more like Esso in the sense that I didn't take things seriously enough. Mm. Um. I think more, I think now I'm probably more like Rhea in the sense that I probably take things too seriously and a little bit need to unlearn that whole lesson of just like what you do and how much you achieve is going to determine the level that you deserve to be loved or at peace, just like what society reinforces in you that sort of like love is conditional and you're mm -hmm. Your sort of your 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 spot on this earth is kind of conditional on you doing X, Y, and Z and being this kind of person. So that that's taken me a while to learn. And so it, all of the characters in this book are me. That's really it. Um, and and I think it's one of the that's, I think that's one of the beautiful things about writing is realizing that you are a multi layered person. Um, and so yeah, if if I was to pick anyone, I mean, I think that I'm I'm so I'm Rhea, I'm. I'm the headmaster, <laughs> like uh, I'm, doc, you know, I'm Doctor So. Um, You're very well. And then also people around me are, are kind of all thrown in there, like you know, friends, family, all that sort of stuff. So it's interesting how it works out. But yeah, amazing. And when you even think about it, sometimes I have thoughts, and I'll I'll really zone in on thoughts to try and hear that where the thoughts coming from. And every once in a while, I realize that's not my voice in my head. It's actually a voice from a teacher or mm. my, my mom or my dad. That's my mom's voice in my head that I've just retained. And so even who you are as a person is more complicated than that anyway. So I think you can draw on all that, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, we had a question from Taylor, also like two questions in one um, yeah. about kind of writing, because obviously you write from from two different characters, points of view. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to know which chapters do you have the most fun writing, Esso or Ria's? Um, and also what chapters were the most challenging to write? Oh, so that's really hard to answer which one I have more fun. I'll tell, I'll tell you, I mean, I think Ria's was fun in terms of like the math stuff, just because I'm a bit of a geek um, and the physics stuff, the challenge of of doing that well, right? So, I mean, what I was trying to do with Ria's chapters was sort of like make the maths as visual as possible and also attaching some meaning and significance to it again. So you have a reason to care. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun challenge, um, like seeing all of the ways I've seen these concepts explained online and then try and see if I could do better. Um, with ESO, it was a bit more carefree. So it was fun in that sense. Um, and also, I mean, I put the boy through a lot of shit as well. So that's <laughs> You did. <laughs> I, I put through a lot you of stuff. Both as well. of them. I mean, we'll talk about it in the spoiler section, but like, oh my God, there were some chapters I was like, could this get worse? Yeah, oh, it did. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's funny as well, because I think I mentioned earlier on, like, sort of one of the, the, the books that I was reading to try and figure out how to write. They were just like, however bad the conflict you want to give to your character, just make it worse. And I was like, and you did. Yeah. Gotta do it. 
Got to do it to him. And then, then the hardest, um, I think the hardest thing to write is the ending. It's always mm-hmm. the ending. They, they say it, the best ending is a combination of inevitable yet surprising. And so yeah. how, that's, that's a tough combination, right? So you want to give the reader a feeling at the end where they're like, okay, that makes sense. Like, yeah, that makes sense that happened. But I didn't see it happening exactly that way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so there's just, I remember my first draft, I gave it to a mate and he was, he was like, okay, this is actually quite good. The ending is rubbish. <laughs> um, he said he read the whole thing and then he got to the end and he wanted to chuck his, com- <laughs> chuck his computer. <laughs> the way. Very honest friend. You got to have them. I don't know, yeah. Um, you talk, you've got, we obviously have talked about the fact that you kind of had this, half of the book kind of done in terms of you knew that you were, you were wanting to talk about kind of science and stuff and then you were also wanting to base it in reality but I kind of feel like there's this third part of the book which is that you talk a lot about these like wider I guess what people might consider to be like philosophical or like humanities based topics of like free will and all this kind of stuff like what made you want to talk about those sort of uh, kind of topics as as well was it because you felt like it was like a good way of linking the sort of what people might see as just theoretical science stuff in with it or was it more to do with like wanting to explore the the characters or like what where did that kind of stuff come from yeah it's a good question i mean i, I think th- this first book is is me warming up a little bit um in the sense that i i just wanted to try some stuff man um and my view is that the 21st century will be the century whereby a lot of the subjects that we previously thought as disparate and different from each other are going to be shown to be really, really the same and overlapping with just differences in language. And so really I'm trying, I'm, I was trying with book one as much as I could to make every, like these different things, whether it's sort of physics and maths or stuff on the one side or, or philosophy or like real life smoke, <laughs> how can you make all of this stuff just feel like it interweaves together in a way where you're sort of showing, not telling. That's what I was going for. I mean, I think I'm going to take it even further with, with book two on that stuff. Not necessarily like sort of more abstract or hard to understand, but even more intertwined mm. in a way that feels natural as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think that the, the, the main thing was I wanted to meet people and kids where they were. I think people want to talk about practical stuff, which is I think you see a lot of challenges, practical challenges in ESO and in Rhea's lives, but I also wanted to completely elevate the conversation to uh, uh, the highest level possible so that it's so that everybody who reads it, especially kids, but also adults, um, feel, know that they can explore all the corners of their mind, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to go back to the chat now. You've waited long enough, Wiz. Um, so Wiz asks, what role, if any, does fiction have in empowering young people today? Just, you know, a casual, small yeah, question, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what I mentioned just a second ago about how the, the disciplines will all be found to overlap, I think this is kind of relates to this one. So stories and fiction it's a form of a metaphor. Um, it's a metaphor for how we can, that helps us see our lives through the story. So when you re- read a book, if it's a good book and, and the right book for you, it will act as a metaphor for the things that you're experiencing in your own life. Um, and you get this all over the place. I mean, if I'm going off the reservation for a second, when That's I said right. that all of the disciplines will interlink, I think it's going to be the unifying language will be metaphors. Um, because when you look at, for instance, uh, a, a poet, what a poet is doing is taking something as simple as, like a good poet can take a rock and describe that concrete, solid, practical thing in a way where, in a way that feels completely divine. <laughs> and we'll just talk about all of these ethereal otherworldly. So they use metaphors to connect something concrete to the heavens. And physics is basically doing the opposite. It's taking these invisible object, objects. Like, you know, right now, this phone, this laptop is connected to the internet via Wi-Fi. So it's an in, invisible forces governing this conversation. 
but physicists have found ways to use mathematical mathematics as a metaphor to describe this crazy abstract invisible world in concrete terms that we can understand. And so I think, anyway, again, I, I warned you, I went off the reservation a little bit, but, <laughs> but I think with storytelling, that's another form of metaphor where you have characters on a page that acts as, as vessels again for the stuff that's going in, on inside of you that you can't see. And so it's a way of taking the unseen things within you and giving them presence on a page so you can actually dissect them. Amazing. I mean, so I guess kind of like link to that, <laughs> link to that in some way yeah. through invisible threads. Um, did you have, when you're dealing with like all of these ideas and kind of thoughts and, and all this kind of stuff, did you have any thoughts about like when a reader gets this in their hands, when like a young person gets this in their hands, like this is what I want them to take from the story? Like were there certain things that you wanted them to to come away thinking about or feeling or were you just kind of like, I'm just putting this out there. Yeah, yeah, take what you want, kids. Like <laughs> whatever you get from it is what you get from it. Yeah, I mean, do you know what? I think I think I wanted to like there was definitely some some truths I wanted to 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 hit home. Um, I'll say a couple of them. I think one was about time. And I wanted this to be like a, a truth that had some nuance to it, like kind of two elements to it. Um, so on, on the time camp, you have people who say like, you know, who can't move on from the past um, and think that the past absolutely determines their present. And then you have people who say, hey, you got to live in the now and think about the future. And so the book was almost trying to find something that honored both of those instincts mm. um, rather than having them fight against each other. I, mean, I think in the, in the end, uh, there's a line that goes something like, sometimes you have to look in the past before you can move forward. Mm. But once you do, um, now is the place from where we take that first step forward. Mm -hmm. So kind of just trying to unify that, that idea that, look, I'm not going to lie to you, there are some things that you might have to look at in your past. I mean, I wrote this book when I was going through something very difficult and I'd, I'd lost a friend. Um, and so it, it kind of came in subconsciously, to be honest. I, it was only after I finished written the, writing the book that I kind of even realized that, that I'd basically put in a plot point mm. <laughs> that very closely correlated with my experience. Um, so I wanted kids to know like who'd been through stuff like that as well, what that looks and feels like. And I, the fact that there's a, there's a future out there worth fighting for. Um, I think the other thing was just, it's subtle, but it's in Rhea's the chapter. I think whenever you're writing about um, time travel, the, you always end up talking a little bit about free will and, and, mm. and determinism. Um, and even there, the, I, my answer to that was kind of, it's both, right? So sort of, we are definitely, um, there, there are times when you need to give a kid the advice that, look, this isn't your fault. Um, you know, the, you're in a really crappy situation and you shouldn't blame yourself. Um, and the other times when that's not helpful, when you have to, when you have to give somebody as much agency as possible for them to help themselves. And I think the best conversations are ones where you get both, where someone says, hey, it's not your fault, but it's your problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. It's not your fault, but it's your problem. Um, that's a really great saying. Um, so like with all these ideas and stuff that you were, were putting into it, were you reading a lot while you were writing this? Um, like whether that's fiction or nonfiction, or was it very much a sort of like, I just need it to be my brain. I don't need to suddenly be going down all these avenues with other people's ideas and, and just base it on what I know kind of already. Yeah, I did read quite a lot. I think it's, 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 it's hard slash impossible to be a good writer without being a reader as well. Mm. Um, that's not to say that you had to have read a ton of stuff in order to qualify to be a writer. I did it, I decided I was gonna write and I kind of just started writing, well, I started reading a little bit before that and then I ramped it up while I was writing. Um, most of the time I read in order to just understand little elements. So I might read a couple books and just say like, how do the best books kick off a story in a way that just gets you hooked in straight away? Um, you know, how do different authors approach characterization mm. or setting a scene? So it, it actually helped to, to be writing while I was reading because 
you can read a book and not rem- and like a month later not remember almost anything about it um yep. whereas if you're already writing and you know the gaps that you haven't figured out you'll read that book and you'll be like oh and you'll you know underline it and it, it makes reading actually more sort of yeah more powerful more more mm. useful <laughs> yeah um, that's a really good point yeah. Um, I can't believe I've gone this long, uh, without talking about the movie. Ooh, exciting. Um, so for those who don't know, um, I guess, would you like to tell them what happened, uh, when Hollywood came a knocking? Uh, I heard that they like fat, like they, they leaked the book, like Hollywood got the book before people had read it. It was all new to me as well. Um, and it was peak because it was like middle of corona i'm in my my aunt's <laughs> spare bedroom um, just living just, the life just living the life um and then i put the book out and the book kind of did really well in terms of like the the, the appetite for it from publishers like a bunch of publishers interested so that was sick and had zoom calls with like pretty much all of them so that was just like a, a, a whirlwind um and then literally less than a month later like sort of two three weeks later someone leaked it to some hollywood studios and then that network is just like it's that that whole world is so different it's exactly how it looks in the movies however however you have it you're picturing in your mind that hollywood is it's exactly like that my my agent i got a a, a film agent once we found out it was kind of going around she just called me random times even like Femi, listen up. I just spoke to exactly, <laughs> <laughs> and she just started breaking the stuff down for me, and I'm trying to catch up. Oh, um, but yeah, no, it, it was sick. It was sick. Just sort of talking to quite like some big, big, cool um, studios in the UK and also in the US. Um, and then yeah, Netflix put together this super team, which comprised of Netflix themselves as a studio, and then Danny Kaluuya um, starring in it and producing, and then. Um, a guy named Eric Newman from a, a, a production company, um, Grand Electric. They make like Narcos and Bright and quite a few other things. Um, and, the, you know, Eric's worked on Wayne's World, so sort of like deep. So it's a sick team. Um, it just made too much sense in it. I'm so excited. We've Here's, here's the thing. I'm not saying that it's um, the book club that's doing this, but... Uh, basically every single book that we've picked now has an adaptation and <laughs> i truly believe that it's the energy we're putting into the universe um cuz now we uh, basically it's because we all just want to have none of them have ad- adaptations yet and we just all want to have some kind of group watch party and we're just like re- really just like manifesting uh this let to happen know, let me know <laughs> um that's so wild though like it just you just like yeah it just got leaked yeah chill just you yeah, know no, it was, it was, found it. i mean I, I feel very 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 fortunate um you know it's sick it's so funny as well lie to you overwhelming like mm. so sort of the gradient of change has been steep um and the, every week brings situations that i have no i mean this is my first time doing this for instance mm. and so taking it day by day um and i've just told myself to like just kind of really enjoy it and these are sick i mean this this stuff is easy it's more like when you're in, in a room and you realize you're the only person who doesn't know anything kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure okay yeah. Um, uh god the time is absolutely flown we've not actually got that long left so we're gonna go into the spoiler section gang Ooh. alarms alarms woo, woo, spoilers spoilers um while everyone takes the time to pause if they haven't finished reading um, or get their spoilery questions ready, if they have finished reading, uh, we're going to do a little kind of a uh, break question to guide us through. Um, so I heard you did an event recently with one of our faves, Alice, Alice Oseman. Um, how was that? Like, have you been doing a lot of like big events since you got published? Like, how's it going? How's like debut life going? Yeah, no, it's, it's been fun. I mean, <laughs> So funny you asked about that as well on Sunday. That was a bit peak, I wouldn't even lie to you. <laughs> like you get used to like different styles of like moderators. I mean, you're, 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 you're lovely. This is this is fun. But like sometimes you realize that like these situations, it's more about sort of like getting the more controversial stuff in there. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um and so like i've just never experienced that so that was my first time kind of really yeah feeling all of that stuff that was a new experience um but yeah no it's it's uh it's it's been it's been interesting i think the life of an author is quite interesting in terms of the different things that you have thrown at you basically mm. um the different situations you have to get get comfortable with right um you know sometimes you i mean next week i'll be doing events where i'm for an hour sitting at the front of a stage with like hundreds of kids um you you, t you teenagers can be a bit ruthless so. <laughs> and so you know i mean i think i, I think i'm ready in it but mm -hmm. um you know that's they'll let you know yeah, they will let you know 100 <laughs> percent um, which is what makes, I think, teenagers, yeah, sick. It's, sick. it's a sick age. I mean, it's it. They have a lot of truth to tell the world. So on the one hand, mm -hmm. they're just as smart as us. Um, on the other hand, they're prisoners, <laughs> and so it's a tricky, tricky time. Um, and they let you know about it. Which is fair enough. Um, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I think I think that answered the question, didn't it? What yeah. It? What, um, it? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We're in spoiler section now, gang. You were warned. If you're still here, it's your own damn fault. Um, so question, question from a reader first. We're gonna start it off with a question from a reader, Taylor, because Taylor is also asking the question that everyone wants to know. Um, why did Poppy and Tony decide to leave Rhea and take Olivia? What was what like what was going on? Why? Oh God, what were those reasons? Why did you break us like this? That's a great question. You know what? It's difficult to answer. Um, there's a there's a semi solid answer in here. I mean, and I, it, it's it's one of those things where like I have my hypotheses. Um, I haven't I didn't write it down. I left that out the reasoning, mm -hmm. but I have I have like my beliefs almost. I guess it is my character. So, <laughs> um, but no, I mean it's it's just it's kind of life. I mean. Mm -hmm. Every, most people have been in that situation where they have siblings and for whatever reason, the parents just favor one sibling over the other. Mm. And so she kind of felt the brunt of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think instinctively, my reasoning was that Tony had a better relationship with Poppy or he just favored her. Um, and even though Rhea was doing a lot in terms of probably more of almost the looking after everyone at home, I think she was almost doing that to comp overcompensate. Mm. I was, sense. I like, I mentioned earlier about like heavily hinted at the idea of like, we really were going to the darkest moment pits of hell situation. And yeah. it, like, we know from the beginning, we know from like the very beginning and from the, from the synopsis, like, there's big stakes here, right? Like there's a bullet coming for someone. And at first we don't know who it is. Uh, and then it's like, oh, it's multiple bullets. Oh, cool. Everything's, oh God, um, yeah. uh, uh, the stress. Um, yeah. But like that moment was such a gut punch reading it because you were like so prepared for this other kind of drama and this other kind of like thriller aspect that yeah. this like emotional gut punch was just like, Ugh! like I had to like put the book down for a second and be like, no like yeah, oh she doesn't need this yeah. right now please yeah, tell me why she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't but you know what what readers want to know ultimately is that you can be stripped bare and be put in really rubbish situations mm -hmm. um and you can also not get what you want but get what you need um, yeah which is to, to to actually know how to find resources within when the world takes away everything from without. Mm -hmm. And I also really like that you kind of end it with Olivia, with her kind of having this moment of like, when you're past the point of like the, the point of pain at that initial, like, like gut wound that you can actually acknowledge like, Hey, we're both just these two girls who have been put in an awful situation. And like, realistically, if I had been asked, like, would I have said no? people who have functionally been my parents I won't go with you I'm sticking by this other person who's been my family for that long like actually yeah that acknowledgement where she kind of talks to Olivia again at the end of like 
yeah, I am kind of mad, but we're both in this awful situation. Like if it was so interesting because it's so like complex and so difficult and there isn't like a really neat ending to that. Like it's just that like messy family stuff that yeah. that doesn't have like the, and then everything was fine. The end, la la la. Sure, um, sure. Which sure. I really liked. I also really love a good sibling relationship that's written by people who understand siblings because <laughs> I feel like I can spot an only child writer from a mile away. I'm like, <laughs> you don't so get funny. this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, t- you kind of talked a bit, a bit earlier about like planning or not planning or how that works. Like, was that any kind of like alternate scenes or endings or like plot points that got completely scrapped from like different um, drafts or was it pretty much the same the whole way it was just tweaking little bits? Um, I think previously I had an, a version where at the ending you get to see even more of Esso and Rhea's abilities. Ooh, yeah, because I was gonna say that was like a that was a really nice little teaser at the yeah. end. Little, little um, tease. Yeah, you'll see that in, in book two. Book two is oh gonna be amazing. Bad, bad stuff. Yeah, so exciting. I just love how like yeah, because I feel like at the without that tease, it was kind of like a like you needed something because otherwise it was it wasn't sure if it was like a one-off thing. It wasn't it, like, I wasn't sure if it was going to be like, there is a single window. This is the one event. Like, this is the one thing that can be changed. Like, this is what it is. Or whether it was something that was going to continue and that ending, like, I was, I mean, like I was going to ask, but we've already talked about it, about like, you know, sequel is it, it kind of felt like there was room for a sequel. And I'm so excited that we're getting one because I just yeah, want to, I want to see what happens when you have these people who like have cracked it, like they know what's going on now. And like, what does that lead to? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like that in terms of the ending, like it's uh, it's weird because a lot of the time I kind of ask authors like oh was that always how you knew it was going to end but like with your book it's really weird because it's like the ending is also the beginning is also the middle like it would be really I feel like it'd be really difficult for you to have like not known how it was going to end but like for a while there I really was thinking like is like is anything going to change is there going to be like are we going to divert in Esso's point of view from what we know has happened like which version of time travel are you going with out of those like two options that you you talk about in the in the book yeah. and describe um how I mean, how was that like decision it's, it's for you? tricky eh? i mean it's it's tricky because even on the ending like there was a there's a really strong argument i could have ended the book with more hope and more joy right mm. and i think there's lots of like especially these days where people are like advocating for joy like books which are a bit more joyous versus sort of like trauma focused I think that's a bit simplistic personally. I think it's this is another situation where I think it's a both and situation rather than a either or because A, people don't read stuff that's all joyous because we read books to sort of see someone to go through something and go come out the other side. Um, yeah, anyway, but I think um, one, I, I struggled with the choice of whether to give Rhea her mom back at the end. Mm. I think a lot of people, including me, would have loved to see that. But I, I I almost didn't because I was trying actually to be sensitive to people in that situation. Mm-hmm. Like I think one of the most cruel things you can do as a writer, and I'm not saying this is the worst thing in the world, but I'm sure I'm, I'll be guilty of it at some point or, or in some way because I'm imperfect. But you know, you, for instance, you have a blind a blind character, um, and at the end they just get their eyesight back magically. Um, and so if you're blind in real life. You read that and you sort of like that didn't help me one bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just sort of magic, magic. You know, like yeah. And so I wanted to tell a story that was real, and still had hope, which I think is much more challenging, but much more hopeful, and useful. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of fit with like everything you talk about the idea of like what you just said, like your your past informs your present, that it kind of informs your future, and and a lot of like those lessons are difficult if then then it's suddenly like oh but this hot this whole thing that's been like a real big part of your past and your present and your future actually is totally reversed don't worry about it like I totally understand <laughs> I was like oh actually like this is a big part of like the thing that really was so difficult and that so many people interpreted in in the um the book the characters of like as like PTSD and like all this yeah. kind of stuff was just totally reversible I think that that would have been a really a totally different lesson to have learned for the characters. Like it would be making a completely different point in the end to like have that be be the point was that like, and then they go back and everything changes and it's all fine. Like 
it just would have been a different book like it, it makes so much more sense from what you're 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 doing for that to have been the ending um, for sure yeah it, it would have been quite different and out yeah okay give me one second someone's at my door i gotta just make sure that they're gonna really go it. for it in which case femi's femi's answering the door while he does we can just gossip about him no we won't um i'll just say now in that case for people who are who are watching um don't forget that next next month we've got um the lies like wildfire it's another sort of thriller this one a bit different a story of five friends and the deadly secret that could send their lives up in flames it's a good time it's jennifer lynn alvarez uh another jennifer lynn we've had two jennifer lynn uh, authors this uh this year um that's our october read so spooky halloween times um and if you want to know about the other books coming up just check our twitter and all the discord i was just uh we were just gossiping about you while you're away. Don't worry. Yeah, no, I was no, just talking no, about no. the new. I heard the impressions that you were doing of me. New book, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought they were pretty good. Um, <laughs> so I know that we like often have uh, people, people watching and people watching who are sort of aspiring writers themselves. Um, so I'm going to ask you that classic writer question of if you have any advice, either like maybe advice you've been given or stuff that you've like learned along the way that you would really love to like pass on to young young writers, either about like the writing process, publishing process, like whatever. Yeah, sure. So I'll I'll go through this quite bullet pointy. Um, I think, first of all, there's a couple of books that I would massively recommend um, mm. in this order. The first is Stephen King's On Writing. That will just get you into the flow of like what this means, what this whole thing is about, basically, this writing thing and why it's important, etc. And also just get you to get on with the writing. Second is a book called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. That's great mm. for sort of structuring, kind of gives you that, that roadmap I was tell it, talking about before. And then the third one is a book called The First Five Pages by Noah Lugman. That just it's, kind of, it's it's a negative book. It tells you all the ways that your book would get rejected within five pages, like the first five pages. But if you can withstand the, the sort of punishment, like it just gives you all of the, the cheat codes for all the things you need to avoid as a writer. Um, yeah, and then I think otherwise, otherwise, I think write your first draft like and make it i think the, the other biggest advice i would say is like so when you're making goals and this is gonna be very difficult just, I, I'm, I give this advice all the time and i realized just a couple of weeks ago that i wasn't taking myself but um whenever you have a goal put the word crap into that goal and because perfectionism and self-judgment mm -hmm. will kill you they will they will ensure that you don't get past a page because you'll look at that page and decide this isn't good enough. This doesn't live up to some imagined standard, whether that's internal or external. And so don't try and write the perfect thingy. Make a goal, for instance, to say like, today my goal is to write a crap chapter and just finish the goddamn chapter. <laughs> and then the next day it'll go from being crap to good. And then, you know, you can edit it be good to great. And then, you know, it can go from there, but you have to get it down basically. Um, that would be my other piece of advice. I love that. That's amazing. I'm going to do that. Do just do a crap job of tidying up your house is a great, a Seriously, great right? goal, yeah. honestly. <laughs> do it. Just do it. Um, oh my God. Amazing. This was so much fun. This like feels like it's gone so quickly. Um, last, I guess, question for you is like, what's happening next for you? I know that you've said about, um, you're kind of working on the sequel, you know, what yeah. else is, what else is going on for you? What are you working on? Not to like immediately ask what you're doing when you've literally just put a book out, but, um, no, yeah, what's, come what's on, going the, on? The, show, the show must go on. So I, I'm writing the second book, um, which will come out in the next year and a half, actually. So that's, that's quite fun. Um, and I'm executive producer on the Netflix film. So I have monthly calls with Eric and Daniel um, and the writers, etc. Um, so that's been quite fun as well, like a learning experience for me. Um, it's like the perfect level of engagement where I kind of get to jump on and talk about stuff I know, um, but I don't have to do too much work. <laughs> it kind of frees up my time to just write because, uh, yeah, I think um, that the film side of stuff is, is maybe a little, little, little ways away. But anyway, um, I'm also completely random. I'm writing, um, I'm writing a film script with some friends. Um, Ooh, who, very like, exciting. yeah, guys who I know from, from Peckham, including my cousin, a guy named Tosin Emiola, uh, a rapper named CS, and then, um, a poet named Caleb Femi, who's, I think, 
he wrote the book Poor actually. He's quite he's quite big in that. He's a serious wow, dude. Okay. He works with like Virgil and all those guys on yeah, he's he's mad. Um so yeah. Ooh, that ooh. is incredible. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Um, thank you so much for joining. I mean, this has been so so much fun. I've like learned so much of about the book, about you, about everything that's going on with you. So I'm thank you so much for joining us today. 100 percent Thank you for having me. And cheers to all the listeners for, for reading and supporting the thing and yeah, for joining this thing as well. Amazing. I already did the little plug for next month, uh, but I'm gonna do it again. Um, so just to remind you, why is wise lies like wildfire jennifer lynn alvarez is our next read um for halloween so you can join us on the last tuesday of october when we will be talking to her in a live stream exactly like this um don't forget to check out the discord in the description and uh we will see you next month